Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this blessed evening. We ask for your grace to be with us once again. Lead us, guide us, and teach us in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Just want to say welcome, 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 welcome to NHTLH International. We are continuing on the topic of hypertension. I mentioned to you that we were going to stop at a slide last night. I decided to just go back one extra slide as we prepare to move forward. And I'm just going to bring a couple of things up. And I want everyone to keep an open mind as I share what I'm about to share. I feel it is best to share things in a friendly environment and give God's children full understanding of a situation than to let God's children hear these things on the outside. Okay? So, we are talking about hypertension, one nation on pressure. Um, so, right here we are addressing examples of stimulating drinks or foods. If you take a look right here, we have ginger. Now, want to let you know our position on ginger. Ginger is something that individuals can use on a daily basis. However, because ginger is stimulating, we found that individuals with high blood pressure needs to show caution and not use ginger if they are hypertensive. Okay? So just to make that plain, ginger is something that you can use on a normal basis um, in your food preparation um, or you know, if it's something you're using for digestion or settling the stomach or building, a, building the immune system. However, for individuals with high blood pressure, it is not something that we would recommend. Okay? Um, caffeine and items that are related to caffeine will have a stimul um, stimulating effect and thus increase the blood pressure. Um, for example, we found that... Um, if you do one cup of coffee, we find that the coffee will increase to about five or six points. Um, it does raise the coffee. Cocoa and chocolate will do a similar thing as coffee because what you find in cocoa, the, the bean itself, it's, you know, um, is something called theobromine. Theobromine is the cousin or you can say the sister or the close relative to caffeine. Its effect on the body is pretty much identical to that of caffeine. So in a situation, again, we do not recommend the use of um, cocoa, chocolate, um, hot chocolate, or these type of drinks because of the theobromine that is found in these items, highly stimulating, that has the same negative effect. Energy drinks, same thing. You know, I remember the other day my younger brother and I, we decided to take a drive to New York. We were in Atlanta, and he and I were heading up to New York. And what we did, um, and saints, you got to remember, when I say the other day, this was about maybe 20 years ago. So that's my the other day, okay? So for individuals that are listening and are saying, wow, we didn't know Brother Luke drank Mountain Dew or use no dose. So that, that's about 20 years ago. Amen? So my brother and I, we decided we're going to take a trip up to New York. And it was roughly about a 16-hour drive. And we wanted to just hit it once and for all without having to stop, you know, without having to stop and sleep. So we both decided to stop at the gas station. We got something called no dose, which are caffeine pills. And along with that, we got a case of dew. Um, we got a big case of Mountain Dew. So in addition to the no-dose, we're drinking um, Mountain Dew, which is loaded with caffeine, and we're going to take this all the way to New York. Lo and behold, my brother and I drove nonstop except for times when we st um, stopped to use the restroom. We went straight to New York. Now, when we got to New York, I got to tell you this, Saints, I was extremely tired, extremely sleepy, 
but my eyes would not close. And when I looked down at my chest, my heart was like it was beating out of my chest. Um, I decided, okay, on our way back, I will not be taking any form of stimulating items on our way back. Um, my brother roughly now, let's see, he's about, let me see if I can peg him right, nine years younger than me. And so on our way back, I was the first, I said, look, I'll take first shot. And I jumped behind the wheel, says within two hours I was out. Two hours I was gone. Um, all that sleep, because we drove up on like the Friday and we left the Sunday. So it was just a quick weekend hop. Run up, come back down. You know, we had to start work for Monday. So um, I can tell you, saints, within a couple of hours, I was gone. My brother took the wheel. And my brother drove the next 14 hours nonstop. He took his no dose took the Mountain Dew, and he says, look, James, see ya, don't want to be ya. And lo and behold, he was gone, nonstop. Says, I slept almost the, whole, the full 14 hours on our way back home. Um, I opened my eyes a couple of times to just look up and just fell right back. I remember one time when I looked up, it was just to direct my brother and says, oh, no, don't take that route, take this route, and... You know, and that was it. I was gone. And at Saints, I can tell you, since then, I have driven the same 16-hour trip, and guess what? Non-stop, and guess what I drink? I drink heaven's choicest blessing. I drink water, but the way I do it, I go to sleep early, get adequate level of rest, leave out about 2 a.m. in the morning, and I drive non-stop, same exact way, without having to take any form of stimulating um, items. Um, and that would have covered um, the caffeine drinks, the caffeine energy tonics, and tablets. I can also tell you one of the things that you'll find when dealing with cancer is when caffeine is introduced into the system, what caffeine literally does, um, caffeine actually, um, let's see here, what it actually does, it actually stops the cells itself from being able to repair itself. So normally the cells have the ability to repair themselves, but when caffeine is introduced into the system, it does not have that ability. So you'll tend to run into some issues in that situation. Um, I see Sister Nash is saying that I should check my volume level, but do me a favor, saying, here's what I want you to do. I just want to make sure that I'm fine. Okay, Sandre, you say loud and clear. Um, anyone else, if you can hear me loud and clear, just let me know. Okay, Sister Antoinette, she says, I'm um, good. So Sister Nash, it might be the internet on your side. Okay, so let me go right ahead and continue. Kit um, is saying good. So everyone else is saying good. So Sister Nash, I would have to say it's probably internet on your side. Um, let's go right ahead here. Um, I wanted to make sure that you understand my position on Ginger, so I decided to reference the prophetess, Sister Ellen G. White, and let you see what Sister White had to say about Ginger. And here's what she said here. Sarah bought a bottle of milk and some warm water this morning. I put Ginger in it, and it went well. In regard to our using spice, I plead not guilty. We have not had spice in our house for 10 years, except a little ginger, which we have always used to some extent. If we understand the nature of these roots and herbs and make a right use of them, there would not be a necessity of running uh, for the doctor, doctor so frequently, and people would be in a much better health than they are today. So it lets you see that the prophet um, did recommend the use of ginger um, just as a normal basis as well as for medicinal situation. Um, however, um, we are saying that if someone has high blood pressure, they should not utilize ginger. Okay, so just be mindful of that. 
Um, perfect example. Um, Sister White, she was allergic to beans. Um, beans is something that we strongly recommend. Um, it's something that was given to us by the Creator Himself for us to use. But one of the things that you'll find that to Sister White, it was actually a deadly poison. Okay? So in that situation, um, she was not able to use beans. Um, but for the ones who could, they were able to. So same situation we're saying here. There might be a few individuals that may not be able to use ginger simply because of the fact they're dealing with a little pressure. So in that situation, you leave that alone. Now, let's continue where we left off here. Okay, it says here, um, let, let me go back one thing here. Perfect, one slide here. It says, examples of stimulating drinks or food. Um, we talked about the alcohol. Okay, and this is the slide we left off, and I told you that I had a spe uh, special slide that I wanted to introduce. And here is what's going on. You and I have talked about this. We have talked about it over and over in numerous lectures, that um, vinegar is alcohol spoiled twice. Vinegar is alcohol of the highest level and it should be removed from all forms of dietary intake, period. No if, ands, or buts. Now, listen what it says here. Um, carbonated drinks needs to be avoided. Tobacco needs to be avoided. Meat, flesh, and all of its byproducts, because we know it forms a chemical as it begins to age called theobro um, oh, hypoxanthine. So the chemical it forms as flesh begins to decay or age is called hypoxanthine. Hypoxanthine have the same exact um, similar effect like that of caffeine or theobromine in terms of, um, uh, in terms of a stimulatory type effect on the body. So in that situation, these items all contribute to elevation of one's blood pressure. Spices, things like hot pepper, cayenne pepper, chili pepper. Um, you have, uh, uh, what's the one in Jamaica that most people in Jamaica like? The scotch bonnet, um, the nutmeg, the cinnamon, the clove. These items are all items that one should eliminate from the diet. Now, let's say someone has a toothache, and you take a little clove oil and you drop in that toothache. There's nothing wrong with that at all. If someone has an issue with a little blood sugar and you use the, the, the cinnamon and you make a tea to help regulate that blood sugar, nothing wrong with that. However, there are so many other ways that we can actually use the um, lower blood sugar where we do not need to actually um, go to the cinnamon in that situation. So there are so many other ways that we can actually do it where we would have tremendous success. Now, the next thing is, is your condiments, the ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise, mayonnaise, veggies, salad dressing, pickles, spices, vinegar, should be completely eliminated. As a matter of fact, here is the slide that I wanted, to, wanted you guys to know about. I don't know how many of you guys knew about this, but I want you to know that our prophetess, Sister Ellen G. White, she struggled with vinegar. Um, and some of the hate sites that are out there, you know, they said she was an alcoholic. Well, say, let the truth be told, vinegar is alcohol of the highest level. Vinegar is fermented alcohol. So I would have to concur with them and said, you know, she did struggle with alcohol because we know that vinegar is alcohol. But praise the Lord, she got the victory. And what an encouragement for you and I. You know, as we look and we see that the prophetess of God had struggles like you and I, it even, it's a greater warning why all of us should avoid this vinegar situation. As a matter of fact, let me read the quote as it says here. There was a time when I was in a situation similar in some respect to yours. I had indulged the desire for vinegar. But I resolved with the help of God to overcome this appetite. I fought the temptation 
determined not to be mastered by this habit. For weeks I was very sick, but I kept saying over and over, the Lord knows all about it. If I die, I die, but I will not yield to this desire. The struggle continued, and I was sorely afflicted for many weeks. Although that it was impossible, although it, although that it was impossible for me to live, you may be sure we sought the Lord very earnestly. The most fervent prayers were offered for my recovery. I continued to resist the desire for vinegar, and at last I conquered. Now I have no inclination to taste anything of, of the kind. This experience has been of a great value to me in many ways. I obtain a complete victory. You know, I give God praise as I see the prophet was able to overcome this situation, especially with the challenges that she so faced in this situation. Amen? What are the causes of hypertension? We found that low potassium level. Um, potassium is necessary for the heart and kidneys and other organs to work normally. Saints, let, give me one second here. As you would have listened to the news, you would have heard that there's a storm coming through in the area here. Allow me to just bring my windows down a little because the wind is pretty strong so I can continue with our lecture here. One minute. Okay, saints, I am back. Let us continue here. So we found that low potassium is one of the things that do influence one's, one's blood pressure. Okay? However, um, if one can increase the potassium level, you'll find that that will aid with the normalization of the blood pressure. It says potassium is necessary for the heart the kidneys, and other organs to work normally. Let's continue here. Food sources that are high in potassium, the food sources that we found that are very high in potassium, we found that blackstrap molasses, by the way, that is the number one source, that has roughly about 2,490, I think 92 milligrams of potassium per 100 edible gram. You have banana, um, banana, I think, comes in at, at about 300 and something. I don't know the exact, uh, but these are sources that are very, very high in um, potassium. You have your soybeans, um, you have your pecans. Um, nuts in general tend to be a good source of um, potassium. Okay. What about salt? You know, remember earlier on when we did the previous lecture, I told you that there's a section here that I was going to address, and I'll address it later. Well, this is the section that I'm going to deal with right now, where it shows all the statistics where hypertensive have a greater risk of heart attack, have a greater risk of stroke, have a greater risk of heart failure, and I'm going to show you where that comes from where one of the reasons why those statistics come out is because of the false information that was given to individuals that are hypertensive where they were instructed not to use salt. Well now saints we're going to take our time and we're going to break this thing down and you're going to understand the falsehood that have been dealt to so many individuals that are hypertensive. First of all I want you to know that 60% of the people who have high blood pressure do not use salt. Let, let, let me repeat that just that you, to make sure you understand. 60% of the people who have high blood pressure do not use salt. And now, saints, maybe one or two of you that are on this line this evening, or maybe one or two of you that will be listening to this lecture later on, you can attest to what I'm saying because you might be hypertensive and you have not used salt in years, 
and you still have the high blood pressure, and the pressure keeps going higher and higher and higher. The fact that the pressure keep, is still there, and the fact that the pressure keeps going up, lets you know that obviously salt was not the reason. Now, saints, follow me now. If you use that refined white table salt that you see out there, that can definitely cause some issues with one's blood pressure. But I am talking about that pink Himalayan sea salt, that salt that has the 84 different trace minerals, the same amount of minerals that are found in the ocean, the same that are found basically in the human body, the same that are basically found in the earth. That's what I'm talking about. Minerals that are naturally occurring in the human body, minerals that are naturally occurring in the sea, in, um, in the earth. I am talking a salt that is whole. I'm not talking about any form of refined um, um, salt that you may buy at the average store. Okay, remember this, that salt is the second major constituent in our body next to water. Salt is essential for the blood. As a matter of fact, someone came to Sister White with the very same um, quote over almost 160 years ago, and she actually tried what they suggested and came back and countered with what I'm about to say. And listen what the servant of the Lord says. She says, at one time, Doctor tried to teach our family to cook a corn to health reform as he viewed it without salt or anything else to season the food. Well, I determined to try it, but I became so reduced in strength that I had to make a change, and a different policy was entered upon with great success. I tell you this because I know that you're in positive danger. Saints, I want to let you know that if you are one that does not cook with salt, you are in positive danger. I use some salt and always have because from the light given me by God, this article in place of being deleterious is actually essential for the blood. The whys and wherefores of this I know not, but I give it instruction as it is given me. Follow some research information here by Dr. David Brownstein in um, 2014, and this is what he says. Do I have enough salt in my body? <laughs> you know, as I read this, the, the thought came to me that here in Antigua, he, here's what's going on. At the lone hospital that we have here in Antigua, um, I, I've been told that instruction has been given that every patient that walks through the door, the hospital door, they should be given some form of of salt um, drip for rehydration simply because of the fact that we are in a hot country and most people are dehydrated. Now, saints, follow me here. If, if salt was not essential, why in most hospital environment, they tend to give individuals little salt, little water, and in some cases, maybe a little sugar to go along with it. You know, if salt was that bad, you'll find that it would not be given to every patient as, as it's seen here in Antigua and in many other countries that, that do have these solutions for individuals that are dehydrated. It says here, I have a book out called Salt Your Way to Health because I've been actively using and recommending salt in my practice for 20 years. I have checked every patient that walks in my door for their salt levels. And I can tell you, unequivocally, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the vast majority of patients are actually salt deficient. And salt is the second major constituent in our body next to water. We can't live without salt. We don't store salt. We don't store sodium and chloride in our body. We have to get it from our food supply. The studies clearly show. Now, saints, this is where I wanted to take you. Remember? I started, I told you from the beginning when I told you about these statistics and I told you these statistics are false statistics based on the false information that was given to individual and it, um, those statistics are only correct if individuals follow the false information that's given to them. Now let me show you now the negative effect when individuals pull the salt out of the diet. Here's what the signs are saying today. The studies clearly show that if you limit salt in the diet, cholesterol level goes up. Come on, saints. 
Are you beginning to see what's happening here now? What's going up? Cholesterol level is going up. You remember I also showed you that water pill? What does it do? It causes high cholesterol. Let me continue. Triglyceride levels go up. Now, saints, one of the things you'll realize is that when triglyceride and cholesterol combine together, it causes a heart attack and it causes a stroke. So can you see all the elements now are basically working against you? You know, you have been limiting salt in your diet. That increases your risk for heart attack and stroke. Um, also to the medication that you're taking, that increases your, your risk for elevated blood sugar, elevated blood cholesterol, and many other side effects. Put them all together, you have a heart attack and a stroke on its platter. Listen to this now. Um, insulin level goes up. Now, since what does insulin level basically is indicating? That you're running the risk of becoming a diabetic. So if insulin levels are going up here and the hydrochlorothiazide raises your blood sugar, no wonder people who are hypertensive, within a short period of time of start taking that medication, they tend to become um, diabetic. Aldosterone and some other adrenal hormones go up that raise the blood pressure. So guess what? Do not cook with salt, and guess what happens? Automatically, it causes the pressure to go even higher. I find the majority of my hypertensive patients do better when they eat the right kind of salt, which is unrefined salt, and reintroduce salt back in their diet and get their salt levels back up. Who needs to use less salt? Now, if you have kidney failure, these patients cannot eliminate some of the sodium in their diet. They may need to limit salt if they have severe congestive heart failure associated with some kidney failure. They may need to limit salt. And if they are a salt-sensitive individual out there, they may need to limit salt. Um, I found some old, very old research that I thought was best that we put here into the presentation. And this is what it says here. Now, you help me do the math, okay? From 1995 to the year that we're at right now, so it's about 23 years ago, they found this out. Listen what they found out 23 years ago. Let, let's see if you're working with me here. An eight-year study of New York City hypertensive population stratified for sodium intake level found that those on a low-salt diet had more than four times as many heart attacks as those on a normal sodium diet, the exact opposite of what the salt hypothesis would have predicted. Isn't that amazing? 23 years ago, they found out that the information that they were giving out on salt was incorrect. And this is scientific information. This is not just hearsay. This is scientific documentation. A 10-year follow-up study of a huge Scottish heart health study found no improved health outcome for those on a low-salt diet. So watch this now. No improved health, but you can actually worsen your health by actually cutting the salt. In September uh, 2002, the latest and highest quality meta-analysis of clinical trial was published in the British Medical Journal confirming earlier meta-analysis conclusion that significant salt reduction would lead to very small blood pressure changes in sensitive population and no health benefit. Since the research is in and it clearly shows that limiting salt in the diet, in the cases that I show you, puts you at risk for worse situation than it was when you originally was using the salt. However, now, we don't want you overdoing it on the salt. You know, you use salt, but just salt the food to taste, and that's it. Don't put no salt shaker on the table to add any extra salt to the diet. Um, just use what's needed, and you'd be fine. As I shared with you earlier, the salt that we recommend is the pink Himalayan sea salt. Um, it has 84 different minerals in it, um, the same 84 minerals that are found in our bodies and roughly in about the same quantities. Why is salt important for us? Why is salt important for us? Here's some basic things that you can understand why salt is important for us. Salt helps stabilizes um, irregular heartbeats. 
It regulates the blood pressure in conjunction with water. It extracts excess acidity from your body cell, particularly the brain cells. It balances the sugar levels in the blood. It, gener it generates hydroelectric energy in your body cells. Increases conductivity in nerve cells for communication and information processing. Enhances absorption of nutrients through the intestinal tract. It clears mucus plugs and sticky phlegm in the lungs, particularly in asthma and cystic fibrosis individuals. Clears up congestion and sinuses, sharpens vital brain functions, is anti-aging, peaceful, ease cramps, purifying, stronger libido, um, replenishes um, vital electrolytes, food tastes better when cooked. Uh, need I say more? Amen? Iodine deficiency also can cause high blood pressure. It says here iodine is essential for proper functioning of the thyroid gland, which regulates the metabolic rate of the human body. Also, other hormones necessary to regulate blood pressure. The use of iodine would prevent thyroid-related illnesses, such as a slow metabolic rate, goiter, hypothyroidism, Hashimoto hypothyroidism, overweight, extreme fatigue, depression, and so forth. It can also cause loss of bone density and high blood pressure. A study was done in the U.S. where over 6,000 patients were tested, and it was found that over 96% were deficient in iodine, and the vast majority of those 96% were severely deficient in iodine. Similar numbers are found across other countries. Now, saints, this thing is so deep, you, you know, it's amazing, right? Because if you, you cut the salt out of your diet and you're dealing with iodine, which is a trace mineral, which is normally where you'd get a decent amount of iodine from, and all of a sudden you start affecting the thyroid, which is basically most people consider it as the master gland. It helps regulate and control metabolism. Um, you, you find now, all of a sudden, now, you are at risk for obesity because if you slow down the thyroid, you're going to put on the extra blessing. As you put on the extra blessing, there comes the extra weight, there comes the diabetes, there comes all of the other diseases that tends to be associated with obesity because as the thyroid is affected, you'll find that the extra blessings will come on. Uh, the following items tend to also hinder iodine from being properly absorbed. Um, you have things like fluoride, chlorine, cassava, corn, as well as the cruciferous family. Um, that's why the toothpaste I use, I use a tooth powder. Um, very few ingredients in it. It tastes absolutely amazing. It keeps your breath fresh basically all day long. You, you know, so that tooth powder we, we use um, at the health food store is, is absolutely amazing. I've had individuals come with the worst case of dental um, issues and in no time we're able to correct them. I've had little kids come with their teeth basically black. It seems like this one family had some sort of gum disease and the children's teeth would just be black. And began, we began using the tooth powder and in no time you see those teeth clear up and come back to that nice, nice lustrous color. Um, chlorine that you find in all of the water basically that most people are bathing with and so forth and in some homes some people may even drink it um, you'll find that that water also too um, chlorine competes with iodine just like fluoride um, and um, basically restrict it from being absorbed. Cassava um, um, is goitrogenic and cassava also inhibits um, proper thyroid function. So if the cassava isn't prepared properly, you tend to run into some issues with um, thyroid-related issue, especially if you don't plan accordingly when using cassava by adding something called kelp in the diet and use that periodically. It's the same thing with corn. Um, you'll find that a lot of people like to use raw corn, um, or if not, they may like to use corn in terms of roasted here in the Caribbean. Or if they prepare it, they may not cook it properly 
um, to actually help reduce the effect it tends to have and the, on the thyroid. So keep that in mind if you ever do plan to use corn in any form of function. The cruciferous family, things like the broccoli, cauliflower, um, kale, cabbage, um, arugula, watercress, rutabaga, you know, these type of items, they are goitrogenic and it's, imp um, it's imp important that you counter them with something that has iodine in it, otherwise you can slow down the thyroid and put yourself at risk for even thyroid cancer um, in addition to the blood pressure issues and the obesity and so forth that can be caused by having a sluggish thyroid. Um, I want to share with you what Sister White basically had to say here. She had something to say about the preparation of vegetables. And it's important that we, as believers, Bible believers, understand that vegetables was not part of the original diet given to man. Man was only given permission to use vegetables after man's sin. With that being said, you'll find that um, when you deal with vegetables, you need to remember that all vegetables need to be steamed tender except for lettuce. If you do not do that, you'll find that it will make digestion and make health very, very bad. And the reason being, when vegetables aren't broken down properly, it becomes a mechanical irritant in the gut. That fiber, that coarse fiber, that cellulose fiber, will actually damage the gut lining. And as it damages the gut lining, it sets you up for something that I shared earlier on, where it talks about intestinal permeability, or what we call leaky gut, um, as a result of damage to the gut lining, because these vegetables were not properly prepared. So with that being said, I want you to hear what the servant of the Lord had to say to the Seventh-day Adventist people or, um, almost 160 years ago concerning how we need to prepare our vegetables to make them nourishing and palatable. And here's the instruction that was given here. It says tea. Um, that word tea is referring to green tea, black tea, chai tea, white tea, sweet tea, red tea, Lipton iced tea, Earl Grey. These are the type of tea that the word tea means. It stands for Thea Synenesis. Tea and coffee, fine flour bread, pickles, coarse vegetables. Since the first time I heard that term, coarse vegetables, um, I actually had to go and look it up. And it's not a term that's used today. So I had to go back to information back in the 1800 to find under, to gain understanding on what would be considered coarse vegetables. She says, candies, condiments, and pastries fail to supply proper nutrients. Many a student has broken down as a result of using such foods. Many a puny child, you know, since when I was a child growing up here in Antigua, we used to use the word puny. I, I, I didn't know that they used that also in the States, you know. Many a puny child, incapable of vigorous effort of mind or body, is the victim of an impoverished diet. So the servant of the Lord is basically saying here that the consumption of coarse vegetables will actually um, create victims of an impoverished diet. And that's why we recommend things like garlic, things like onion should be steamed tender. Um, garlic is not something you should eat raw. Most people don't realize if you cut garlic and put it on the skin, it, bu it burns a hole on the skin itself. You'll find that water bubbles or water marks shows up under that section that the garlic was placed on. The same thing happened if you eat garlic raw. If you eat garlic raw, it actually damages the gut lining and dis destroy the gut microbiome. So garlic is not something that should be eaten raw. It should actually be steamed. Um, and in that way, it becomes more palatable and digestible. Examples of coarse vegetables. You have things like the broccoli, the cauliflower, the beet, artichoke, celery, rutabagas, turnips, um, radish, Brussels sprouts, watercress, asparagus, fennel, um, cassava, jicama, dashing yam, edi cassava, sweet potato, Irish potato, garlic, onions, all those are examples of um, coarse vegetables. 
Um, remember I told you I went back to a book back in the 1800s to kind of get a deeper understanding? And I found an author that Sister White had relationship with. And as a result, I wanted to hear what they had to say because they wrote on the topic. And listen what the author said. They said, vegetables should be cooked until they are perfectly tender, but not overdone. Many cooks spoil their vegetables by cooking them too long, while quite as many more serve them in an underdone state to preserve their form. Either plan makes them less palatable and likely to be indigestible. It says here, some vegetables such as carrot, spinach, asparagus, and cabbage, when cooked, supply more antioxidant such as carotenoids and ferulic acid to the body than they do when raw. Um, I, I, I love this right here. This is a quote that I really appreciate. It says here, the heat breaks down the plant's thick cell walls and aids the body's uptake of vitamins and minerals that are bounded to those cell walls. The vitamins and minerals are embedded in a complex mass of fiber called cellulose, a carbohydrate that is difficult for the human body to digest. Now, saints, if you had a chance to see what that cellulose fiber looks like, let me tell you something. It's amazing what that thing looks like. That thing looks, looks so coarse and so, it looks like this, you know, um, you know, like when you're going through like the forestry and you see these like ropes, you know, when you used to maybe like watch television and see um, individuals swinging um, by these ropes in the, all these vines in the forestry. Well, guess what? That's like how that cellul cellulose fiber looks like. It looks very coarse, very rough, somewhat of that type of fiber, um, but it's very strong too. So it makes sense that you require heat. And let, let me give you a perfect example. I, I'll give you an example. Any of you guys ever made carrot juice before? Um, let's do this. If you make carrot juice or if you have eaten a raw carrot, you'll find that you have this coarseness behind it and you gotta, you're gotta, you trying to spit that coarseness out. But if you put some heat behind that carrot, all of a sudden, you'll find that there'll be no more coarseness. That heat would have broken down that cellulose fiber. Now, saints, let me share something with you. You see that same cellulose fiber that we're talking about? That fiber is what feeds the good bacteria in your body. That's what feeds the gut microbiome. That's what feeds them and helps them to repopulate, to keep that immune system between that 80 to 90%. But when you're not preparing these vegetables properly, you hinder the feeding process of the gut microbiome. So keep that in mind. Take a look at these items, and as you look at them, you'll see the look. Look at the edges. Let, let me give you an example. If you look around here, you'll see how that stalk looks. That's what we're talking about. Look at the edge of the broccoli right here. Okay, That fiber is very, very difficult to break down. And unless you break that down, you will not have access to those nutrients. Okay. Just start again, we just give you some more different angles of that. Okay, That's what we're basically trying to do here. It says, coarse vegetables, the proper preparation for these food um, is important. Therefore, to make these vegetables tender and more digestible, we re recommend low, slow steaming, cooking, or baking will help to reduce the coarse effect. Now, now saints, Let's deal with the treatment. We're putting this treatment together. If I came to your home and water is coming out of the pipe, okay, water is coming out of that faucet, and there's a stopper in the sink, and water is flowing out of the sink onto the ground, should I grab a mop and start mopping up, or what should I do in its order? Come on, saints, what, what should I do? Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. You are correct. Go to the source. Turn off the faucet. Number two, unplug the sink. And last but not least, we're going to mop it up. If that's clear, you say amen. Okay. And um, San, um, Sandre, you asked, does coarse vegetables include spinach? Yes, it does. The only vegetable it does not include is lettuce. So all vegetables except for lettuce 
needs to be steam tender. Amen? Um, and listen, and that's why I need everyone to go back and watch that My Plate presentation. My Plate 1 through 6, we would have addressed that in there. So you need to go back, everyone, and watch that My Plate lecture, and you'll have the understanding as we move forward, because we're building on the things that, as we go forward. How do you turn off the faucet? We're about to share with you how does one um, turn off the faucet. So you turn off the faucet, unplug the sink, and mop it up. If that's clear, you say amen. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. You ready? Eliminate all flesh and its byproducts from your diet. Eliminate all dairy products. That would be the byproduct. All the fried foods we're going to get out of the diet. All oils. Um, even though the good oils, the coconut oil, the olive oil, we're going to eliminate all oils from the diet also. All those free oils we're going to eliminate. Um, we're going to eliminate all those sugar, the brown sugar, the white sugar, um, because in most cases when you see brown sugar, it's white sugar with some molasses on it, okay? We're going to eliminate and we're going to use natural sweeteners instead, okay? So keep that in mind. Natural sweeteners is what our goal is. All forms of hot pepper, cayenne pepper, chili pepper, scotch bonnet, all the spicy food um, that we're going to eliminate. Wheat products, bread, bun, tart, biscuit, cracker. And it's not that you can't eat the wheat products if they're organic or non-GMO. We're talking non-GMO wheat products, and we're talking, um, no, 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 let me back up. You can have non-GMO wheat products. You can have organic wheat products. What we're talking about is the genetic modified products, wheat products, is what is causing the blood pressure issue. It causes high cholesterol. It causes diabetes. It causes high, um, um, heart disease. As a matter of fact, the research show that two slices of whole wheat bread will raise the blood sugar level higher than two tablespoons of sugar. So under no circumstances, you should cons um, use any form of wheat or flour item unless it says organic or non-GMO, okay? And that will take into perspective the, gluten, the products that we say have gluten. That include wheat, rye, barley, spelt, and also add oats to that, uh, to that for me, please. Add oats to that also. I found that we're having some issues there with the oats that are making it a little bit more problematic. And we're dealing specifically with individuals that are dealing here with the high blood pressure. But you'll find that if you get rid of GMOs, um, it will work wonders for you. As a matter of fact, one of the things that you'll find now that they have, these guys have done, these guys are so strategic, right, that they have even gone as far as isolated the RNA for different races, okay? Which means that two race of individuals can eat, let's say a race, two race, eat orange. One race can eat orange and nothing happen to them. Another race can eat the orange and total destruction to their cells. And the reason being is because these guys have isolated the RNA for the different races and, and as a result, can target specific race for whatever warfare that these individuals are planning. So one of the things I do recommend to individuals, whatever you do, try your best to have your own garden. Try your best to eat as natural and from nature as possible as can. And things that are GMO or non-organic or is not properly listed, leave them alone because they are not food for you. Excessive levels of tyramine. Tyramine is an amino acid from tyrosine to break down protein. It stimulates the release of uh, basically, you know that fight or flight response hormone? Okay, that's what it does. It, it basically stimulates the release of that hormone. Um, you have serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter for regulating learning, um, mood, as well as sleep. The same tyramine is basically, it's a stimulant. Tyramine foods, you find that when foods age or fermented or spoil, tyramine level increases. 
Uh, so that's why if you have an avocado or pear or butter pear or, 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 or uh, uh, zavoka or whatever name you may want to call it, depending on which country you, you, you're from, if it has a little bad spot in it, you cannot cut the bad spot off and use the rest of it. You have to get rid of the whole thing. Say it, you didn't hear me tonight. You got to get rid of the whole thing. And the reason being, these pores go straight through the entire item. And as a result, it poisons the item. Okay? Um, so it lets you know here that tyramine food, such as aged, fermented, or spoiled, things like meat, pork, cheese, chocolate, caffeine, teas, alcoholic beverages, overripe avocados, bananas, breadfruit, will cause elevated blood pressure. So one of the things you cannot do, you cannot with safety trust people who are cooking out there. You cannot with safety because the thing about it, if they see a little bad spot on the avocado and they spend, uh, I'll tell you, give you a perfect example. Tonight, I went out there and a lady was selling avocado for $12. So follow me. Let's say you buy an avocado for $12, right? And you get home now and you cut the avocado again, ready to eat it, and you find that there's like a bad spot in it. People said, $12 I spend now. I'm not going to dump the avocado. Well, saints, and that's why it's important you take your time and properly inspect these items so in that way that when you get home, your item is of the highest quality. You know, like bananas. Uh, you, you know, the other day, I remember I was in town. And while in town, I found a young lady. And the young lady, I saw these rotten bananas on her table. I was ready to just like take them up and dump them. Um, and I said, ma'am, is there any reason why you have those still on the, on, the, on the counter there? She says, yeah, yeah. You know, folks are coming to get that to make banana bread. You know, saints, think about it. You are the ones that's out there eating these banana bread. Can you imagine what is taking place? You know, these items aren't good for eat. How can they be good to make banana bread? Saints, please. You know, I'll tell you, I was just the other day in Barbados. And this nice family, you, you know, they, they send me some, um, some papaya. And lo and behold, that's exactly what the papaya looked like. Had the little bad spot up there, but it's solid. You know, the rest of the papaya is solid. Now, saying, so I just dumped the whole papaya. You know what I mean? Because I know that the papaya was not good. It, 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 there was it. Had a bad spot. It had a spore. Now, let me share with you what the servant of the Lord had to say. But what you'll understand is that there's a side effect of excessive thyramine with certain type of medication. Um, you have excessive thyramine based on age or spoiled food combined with certain medication or certain herbs. It can actually cause central nervous system disorder, heart, kidney, or even hemorrhage within the brain. And this is the thing that people do not understand. There is a science behind it why you should not use these items, okay? So you need to keep that in mind. Let me share with you what the Sermon to the Lord had to say about that specific topic. The Sermon to the Lord says, nicely prepared vegetables and fruits in their season will be beneficial if they are of the best quality, not showing the slightest sign of decay, but are sound and unaffected by any disease or dis decay. Now, saints, this statement is deep. You see that statement it says up there? Nicely prepared vegetables and fruits in their season. I have a friend who owns an orchard in Washington Hills. And he says to me, he says, James, I don't know if you're aware of this, but do you know like when apple, when you go to the grocery store and you buy like apple and pears and, and these things, many times these things are at least a year old. I said, what do you mean? He says, what they do, they buy these items and, and <laughs> so, let me hold that thought and I'll come back to it there, right? I, when I was in the U.S., living in the U.S., I would listen to the news and I would hear, next season, um, we're going to have a shortage of apples. And I would say to myself, right, how they know? 
that next year we're going to have a shortage of apple when the, the trees have not bear as yet. You know, how do they know we're going to have a shortage? But I did not understand until I heard what my friends say. They pick the apple a year in advance. They pick most fruits a year in advance, and they remove the chemical that ripens these fruit, and they keep them in a room that, that, that prevents them from being ripe. And when they're getting ready to send them to the grocery store now, they put that chemical back out again, and lo and behold, you find the ripening process take place. Now, saints, that's why sometimes you're looking at mangoes, and mangoes are all wrinkled and shriveled up. I never in my entire life saw a wrinkle or shriveled up mango unless the mango fall off the mango tree, um, uh, you, you know, before it's time. So when I see mangoes, the skin is shriveling. I'm like, that is a new phenomenon to me because I've never seen that in my life. And I am a mango connoisseur. You know, I'm one. I specialize in mangoes. I know mangoes inside out. So when I see that, I knew there was something wrong. But saints, guess what? They are doing it to my mangoes also. They're doing it to the bananas. They're doing it to basically every possible fruit. Um, the other day, a farmer came to me and offered me some mangoes that I can sell. And he said, should I prepare them for you or not? I said, what do you mean by prepare? You know, saints, I like to act kind of foolish sometimes that I can get more information. I, mean, I said, what do you mean by prepare? He says, you want me to gas them for you? I said, what do you mean by gas them? He said, what happened? Th these people are stealing the mangoes, left, right, and center. So we got to pick them about 70, 75% full. And when I pick them at about 70, 75% full, I gas them to help ripen the process. And that's how I put them out. I said, oh, I said, no, 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 don't, get, don't gas mine. Let mine ripen their own. And, and saints, thus you understand the statement here by the servant to the Lord. She says, nicely prepared vegetables and fruits in their season. You, you know, you'll find that when you eat things that are in season, the nutrients you get are far better than if you actually have these items um, just um, sitting, um, being preserved for usage at a later time. So my recommendation to God's children, make sure everyone is planting some fruit trees out there. or uh, They have some level of gardening, some level of cultivation, so in that way they'll put themselves in a position for the greatest harvest of all time when, when we're placed in situations where um, the food cannot be trusted even on a larger scale. It cannot be trusted already, much less when there'll be a wider issue with food because we are told that the problem with this food thing is going to be far greater than we can ever imagine. The servant of the Lord went on and even says that more die by eating decayed fruit and decayed vegetables which ferment in the stomach and result in blood poisoning than we have any idea of. Let's continue here. Now, one of the things you need to keep in mind is that if you are hypertensive, Grapefruit is excellent in terms of lowering pressure. But if you are on any hypertensive medication, you are not allowed to use grapefruit in any form or fashion because what it actually does, it causes the medication to stay in the system up to three days longer, which will cause an in intensity. It basically intensifies the medication, which will have a, a real serious dramatic effect on you. Um, yeah. Let's go on here. Turning off the faucet still, we're going to avoid excessive salt intake. Avoid refined sugar. Um, avoid high-fat foods. You eliminate coffee and caffeine-related items. All soda, tobacco, alcohol, wine, and vinegar must be eliminated from the diet. Um, every morning you get up, we recommend that you drink two to four cups of warm water and a half lemon per cup of warm water. That, the, the lemon, what it actually does, it helps clear the blood vessels. Um, it's the liver's blessed friend. It actually helps thin the blood also to an increased circulation. Um, anything that is high in water content is basically considered a diuretic, 
which would actually aid with lowering of your blood pressure. Uh, you have cabbage, carrots, beets, asparagus, celery, all those are excellent for you. Um, the cruciferous family, broccoli, cauliflower, all of those are great for you. Um, they lower the blood pressure, the eggplants, the beans, the garlic, the onions, all whole grain items, excellent in terms of lowering blood pressure. Um, things that are high um, in water, as I mentioned to you, is excellent again. Um, sweet potato, granola, prunes, um, those are all excellent items for you. Whole grain items, whole plant foods eaten whole is what we're doing. So we're going to do like all of the whole grains, all of the beans, lecithin. It actually helps emulsify and dissolve and break down fats. Um, things You have natural items that are high in something called L-arginine. L-arginine actually produces something called nitric oxide. When nitric oxide is present, blood vessels relax, blood pressure comes down. You'll find that pumpkin seed, all forms of beans, especially kidney beans, your almonds, those are excellent um, for that. Your nuts, your seeds, your peas, your beans, all of those are excellent. Um, ultimately converts to um, nitric oxide, which actually aids with the lowering of one's blood pressure. Um, what I want to do, I'm going to go ahead and pause right here at nitric oxide because this is such an important area that I would like to discuss. And when we pick up, we will continue on hypertension. So I'll pause right here for tonight's lecture. Let's go ahead and we're going to end the recording here. And I'll answer any questions that anyone have. And then we'll continue with from nitric oxide.